Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Priscilla A. Jung. I know that Dave pronounced it a different way <laughs> prior to the sparkling <laughs> event. I know you didn't come along for the sparkling. Um, came along to hear Priscilla. So um, Priscilla uh, is uh, a young endocrinologist, uh, a young immunologist. Uh, she, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> she um, came into her PhD just as she finished doing a clinical immunology training without any laboratory experience. And um, she came to me and said, I want to do a PhD. And I said, oh, OK, this is what we do in the lab. And she said, no, I don't want to do any of that. Um, I want to work on a disease which she'll tell you about today. And I, uh, I don't know about that. And then she says, I think it's an autoimmune disease. And I said, OK, <laughs> that's fine. Um, so. Uh, she, she came in, she didn't know anything about doing lab work, and I hope she's learnt something over the last couple of years, but she has elucidated this uh, condition, this disease, a bit more, and it's quite a common disease. I think if you look around the audience here, some of you have probably had it at one stage, and uh, we see a lot of patients in the clinic with this. If we go to the clinic each week, uh, our big clinic on Thursday, I'd say probably a quarter of the patients that I see seem to have this condition. Um, in any case, Priscilla battled on and she has done this on her own uh, with uh, N equals 1 in the lab and uh, I think she's done a pretty good job and it set the stage for what we can do in this condition for the future. So thank you, Priscilla. And uh, so thank you for coming along today. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about a disease called chronic idiopathic urticaria. Uh, urticaria is also known as hives or welts, and it's an itchy raised red rash that you can see here. And urticaria is actually quite common. Uh, it occurs in 20% of the population at some point in their lives. There are many causes of urticaria uh, classified into acute and chronic. By definition, acute is less than six weeks in duration and chronic is six weeks or longer. And acute causes include allergy, uh, for example, to food, uh, direct mast cell degranulation, uh, for example, triggered by opiate medications and infection. Chronic causes include the physical urticarias that are triggered by certain physical stimuli uh, such as heat, exercise, pressure, cold temperatures. Uh, urticarial vasculitis is a mixture of ordinary urticaria and inflammation in the sm small blood vessels in the skin. And finally, there's chronic idiopathic urticaria, uh, which is what, what we were interested in. Uh, so chronic idiopathic urticaria, or CIU, is the recurrence of urticaria over a period of at least six weeks uh, due to no apparent clinical trigger. The prevalence of CIU is 0.1%. It affects children and adults and is three times more common in women than in men. Uh, CIU is diagnosed clinically because there's no reliable diagnostic test. And CIU has a significant negative impact on quality of life uh, to a similar extent as other skin diseases such as psoriasis. And the patients report that the constant itchiness is actually the worst symptom. The dermal mast cells and basophils are the main effector cells uh, in CIU. Uh, these cells become activated and they degranulate, releasing mediators. And, oops, uh, and histamine is the main mediator uh, in urticaria. Uh, histamine causes vasodilatation uh, and fluid leakage into tissue, uh, which results in the swelling and redness in the urticarial lesion, otherwise known as the wheel. And there's an axonal reflex uh, that results in the surrounding erythema, uh, also known as the flare. And there's evidence that leukotrienes are also responsible for forming urticaria. Uh, in the 1940s, it was discovered that a serum factor induced urticaria in CIU. In the autologous serum skin test, the patient's own serum is injected into the dermis, causing an immediate wheel and flare reaction, uh, 
Uh, histamine is used as a positive control and saline is used as a negative control. In the 1990s, the serum factor was identified to be autoantibodies targeting the mast cells and basophils. Now, these cells express the high affinity IgE receptor, FC epsilon R1, on their surface, which binds IgE. And in CIU, there are IgG autoantibodies against the FC epsilon R1 alpha subunit, and IgG autoantibodies against the receptor bound IgE. And in each case, the receptors are cross-linked, the mast cells and basophils become activated and release histamine. Uh, however, uh, these autoantibodies are detected in the serum in only 50% of CIU. So our question was why they were not detected in more patients. We considered potential problems in the immunoassays and in the assay to detect FC epsilon R1 alpha antibodies, IgE in the patient's serum could potentially bind to the FC epsilon R1 alpha substrate and block the binding site for FC epsilon R1 alpha antibodies and therefore interfering with their detection. I think it's interesting that in CIU, autoantibodies bind a receptor, FC epsilon R1, and its ligand, IgE, and anti FC epsilon R1 alpha and anti IgE could potentially bind to each other, forming immune complexes in an idiotypic network, and that would hamper the detection of each antibody. And thirdly, CIU is a skin disease, and if the autoantibodies are all deposited in the skin, they may not be detected in the blood. And lastly, it's quite possible that autoantibodies just do not exist in some patients. And the question then would be, what is the mechanism of disease in these cases? Um, so going back to the skin, this is a section taken from an urticarial lesion. In CIU, there is edema throughout the dermis. There's also a perivascular infiltrate uh, made up of mixed inflammatory cells. And T cells are actually the predominant cell in this infiltrate, comprising up to 80%. And so this led us to believe that T cells play a role in CIU. There's other evidence to suggest that T cells are involved. Uh, there are reports that CIU is associated with the HLA-DR4 allele. In a study of 100 British Caucasian patients, 61% uh, uh, had the DR4 allele, uh, compared to 35% in their controls. And this suggests that the, that the DR4 molecule present certain peptide epitopes to CD4 positive T cells. And the presence of high affinity IgG autoantibodies suggests that the T cells have provided help during B cell maturation. And furthermore, T cell suppressive medications such as cyclosporin are effective treatment. And as yet, there are no published data on antigen specific T cells in CIU. Our hypothesis is that a CIU is characterised by T cell autoreactivity to FC epsilon R1 alpha. In this diagram, the antibodies to FC epsilon R1 alpha are well described, and we propose that the T cells target the same self antigen. And we don't know if Th1 cells or Th2 cells or other types of T cells might be involved. Uh, so, as an example, in late phase allergic uh, reactions, the Th2 cells drive antibody production, activate mast cells and basophils, and re recruit eosinophils. And we don't know if similar interactions occur in CIU. We aim to identify T cell reactivity to FC epsilon R1 alpha in CIU and to characterize uh, the phenotype of these cells. And we aim to uh, see if particular T cell responses are associated with antibody responses or clinical characteristics. We also aim to study the skin in CIU to identify inflammatory cell signals to provide information on pathogenesis. Uh, first, we recruited participants from the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Uh, we recruited 60 uh, CIU, uh, 20 disease controls and 20 healthy controls. Disease controls for patients with other urticarial conditions, uh, including food allergy, 
urticaria vasculitis, urticaria pigmentosa, the physical urticarias, and bee venom allergy. The median age in the CIU group was 41 and a half years, which was similar to uh, the control groups. Uh, there were more women than men in each group, and 77% of our CIU group were Caucasian. The, our CIU group showed a wide range in disease duration, the median being 54 months at the time of recruitment. We measured disease severity using the urticaria activity score, or the UAS. The median score was four out of a possible six. In terms of medications, 25% of our CIU group were not on any medications when clinical samples were collected, but 60% were on H1 antihistamines, 19% were on leukotriene receptor antagonists, and some patients were on immunosuppressants, uh, including hydroxychloroquine, corticosteroids, uh, methotrexate, and azathioprine. Looking at the HLA-DR genotypes, the most common uh, allele in our group was DR11, present in 32%, which was higher than the 15% in the Caucasian Australian population. Uh, the next most frequent alleles were DR4, DR3, and DR15, but they were present at similar frequency as the Caucasian Australian population. In the next part of the project, we looked at uh, immune responses to FC epsilon R1 alpha in peripheral blood. The self-antigen that we were interested in is FC epsilon R1, and this receptor has an alpha chain, which is mostly extracellular and binds IgE. The beta and gamma chains are mostly intracellular. For experiments, we used a recombinant protein comprising the alpha uh, chain, and this was provided by CSL. Uh, first, we looked for T cell proliferation to FC epsilon R1 alpha. Uh, CFSE labeled PBMCs were cultured with FC epsilon R1 alpha protein for seven days and then analyzed by flow cytometry. These flow plots are from a CIU patient who responded. So after PBMCs were cultured with no antigen, 6.3% uh, of CD4 positive T cells were CFSE low, uh, indicating low background proliferation. And after PBMCs were cultured with FC epsilon R1 alpha, 63% uh, of CD4 positive T cells were CFSE low, indicating strong proliferation to the antigen. And in this patient, the antigen-specific precursor cell frequency was actually very high at 17%. So looking at all the patients, uh, looking at the proportion of CD, uh, CD4 positive T cells that were CFSE low in CRU group, disease controls and healthy controls, in response to zero or 0.1 micromolar of FC epsilon R1 alpha, uh, proliferation increased with the antigen in the CIU group, but not in the control groups. And background proliferation varied between individuals. And in the graph uh, on the right, uh, results have been normalized by subtracting background proliferation so that we could compare the groups. Uh, the CIU groups show higher proliferation than healthy controls. Overall, uh, proliferative responses were seen in 29% of CIU and not in the controls. To assess whether proliferation was antigen specific, we used a FC gamma receptor protein, and this protein was made in the same system as the FC epsilon R1 alpha protein, and it was also provided by CSL. Uh, so in these three CIU patients, uh, PBMCs cultured with FC gamma R2 alpha didn't respond, whereas PBMCs cultured with FC epsilon R1 alpha uh, responded. And this confirmed that proliferation was FC epsilon R1 alpha specific. We followed four CIU responders over time. Uh, these patients... 
uh, had proliferative responses at the time of recruitment. And the responses uh, persisted at two months, six months, nine months, and 14 months. So we now know that CD4 positive T cell proliferation to FC epsilon R1 alpha can persist for over a year. We wanted to know if the reactive T cells were Th1 cells producing interferon gamma. And in a modified ELISPOT experiment, uh, we cultured PBMCs with the FC epsilon R1 alpha protein in brown bottom plates for 24 hours. Uh, the cells were then transferred to an ELISPOT plate that had been coated with anti-interferon gamma antibodies uh, and incubated overnight. Uh, interferon gamma that was released became bound and after developing the plate uh, showed up as uh, interferon gamma spots. And these wells are from a CIU patient who responded. Uh, so PBMCs cultured without antigen uh, showed very few spots uh, and PBMCs cultured with the antigen showed numerous spots. To assess antigen specificity, uh, P we cultured PBMCs with FC gamma R2 alpha, our negative control protein, and there was no response, uh, while PBMCs cultured with FC epsilon R1 alpha responded. So the, inter uh, so the interferon gamma response is FC epsilon R1 alpha specific. Looking at all the patients, uh, interferon gamma release increased with the antigen in the CIU group and not in the control groups. And again, background release was quite variable between individuals. And in the graph on the right, the results have been normalised again by subtracting background release. The CIU group showed higher interferon gamma release compared to disease controls and healthy controls. And overall, interferon gamma responses were seen in 59% of CIU and not in the controls. We followed three CRU responders over time, and these two patients uh, had persistent responses at three months and nine months. But in this patient, the interferon gamma response was lost at 10 months, uh, despite there being no change in the clinical par parameters at all. Uh, so we've clearly detected interferon gamma responses to FC epsilon R1 alpha in a subset of patients, and we still wanted to know if other T cell subsets are involved. Uh, so we look for some Th2 cytokines by ELISPOT. IL-5 responses were seen in 32% of CRU and not in controls. IL-13 responses were seen in 32% of CRU and not in controls. Uh, but overall, these responses were not higher in the CRU group. We look further for Th2 cytokines. Uh, we collected uh, cell culture supernatants uh, after PPMCs were, were cultured with FC epsilon R1 alpha. And we look for IL-5, IL-13, IL-4, uh, IL-3, 9 and GMCSF by multiplex assay. There was an increase in IL-5 in the CIU group uh, after 24 hours in culture with the antigen. Uh, but for the other cytokines, there were no differences between the CRU and control groups. So we have found some evidence of Th2 involvement in CRU. Next, we studied humoral responses, looking for serum autoantibodies to FC epsilon R1 alpha. We did this by immunoprecipitation. Uh, first, we labelled the FC epsilon R1 alpha protein with ID in 125 and we incubated that with serum IgG. Uh, antibodies uh, bound the labelled protein, uh, forming immune complexes that were pre uh, precipitated. And gamma activity uh, from the precipitated protein was detected. Uh, the CRU group showed higher gamma activity than disease controls and healthy controls, and overall, uh, antibodies to FC epsilon R1 alpha were seen in 44% of CIU and not in controls. 
uh, to assess uh, the antigen specificity, uh, we pre-incubated positive sera with unlabeled FC epsilon R1 alpha protein before further incubation with the label protein. And this uh, uh, decreased uh, gamma uh, activity and confirms that the antibodies are FC epsilon R1 alpha specific. We have data uh, on T cell proliferation, uh, cytokine and antibody responses in 30 CIU patients. If we look at proliferation and the cytokines, 10% uh, uh, had only proliferative responses, 20% uh, had proliferative and cytokine responses, and 64% had only cytokine responses. And I think the highest cytokine detection rate just reflects the highest sensitivity of the Elispot assay. And using these assays in combination, we detected responses in 94% of CIU. If we look at proliferation and antibodies, 20% had only proliferative responses, 37% uh, had only antibodies, and 10% had both responses. And using these two assays in combination, we detected responses in 67% of CIU. If we look at cytokines and antibodies, 44% had cytokines only, 7% uh, had antibodies only, and 40% had cytokines and antibodies. And using those assays uh, in combination, we detected responses in 91%. So putting all the assays together, 47% uh, of patients had antibodies, uh, and, but everyone who, uh, so all the patients who were antibody negative had T cell responses. Um, so using all the assays in combination, we detected responses in all of our patients. So in other words, adding T cell assays uh, increased diagnostic sensitivity. We came across an interesting finding when we compared antibody with T cell responses. So patients who had high antibody levels had low interferon gamma responses, and patients who had high interferon gamma responses had low antibody levels. Uh, this could be an, an example of an immune deviation, uh, which was uh, reported, described in the 1970s in experiments using salmonella flagellin as, as the antigen, uh, antibody and Th1 responses were divergent. Uh, we also see immune deviation in auto, other autoimmune diseases such as type 1 diabetes, uh, where there's an inverse relationship uh, between Th1 and antibody responses to the GAD antigen. When we looked at the responders more closely, the interferon gamma responses occurred earlier in disease than antibodies uh, by a median of three and a half years. So in other words, uh, different immune responses predominate during different stages of disease. So it's possible that interferon gamma uh, secreting cells initiate CIU, leading to antibody production in late established disease. So to summarize this section of the talk, uh, we've identified T cell autoreactivity to FC epsilon R1 alpha uh, with CD4 positive T cell proliferation in 29%. The main cytokine produced is interferon gamma uh, in 59%. And we found IL-5 and IL-13 responses in a smaller number of patients. Uh, we detected serum autoantibodies to FC epsilon R1 alpha in 44%, which is in keeping with what's reported in the literature. And we found an inverse relationship between antibody and interferon gamma responses um, which could be an example of immune deviation. So at this point, our question was whether the peripheral blood findings reflect pathology in the skin. And this led us to study the skin lesions in CIU. Uh, we took punch biopsies from CIU patients, from the lesions themselves, as well as from non-lesional skin. We also took punch biopsies from healthy controls and we studied histology and gene expression. Uh, on the H&E sections, uh, there were inflammatory infiltrates uh, 
around blood vessels in the dermis within the CIU lesions in every patient. And, but interestingly, the inflammatory infiltrates were also seen in CIU non-lesional skin. In contrast, there were very few inflammatory cells in the healthy control skin. The infiltrates uh, contain CD3 positive cells and CD4 positive cells uh, in the lesions as well as in non-lesional skin. And there were more CD4 positive T cells in the CIU lesions than in healthy control skin. Uh, CD8 staining was less pronounced, uh, but there were more CD8 positive T cells in CIU lesions than in healthy controls. Uh, there were more CD68 positive macrophages in CIU lesions uh, than in healthy controls. Uh, there were neutrophils uh, showing myeloperoxidase staining in the CIU lesions uh, in several patients and in non-lesional skin in one patient, and there were no neutrophils in the healthy control skin. There were a few eosinophils in the CIU lesions and non-lesional skin in some but not all patients, but there were no eosinophils in the healthy controls. Uh, B cells were sparse in CIU skin as well as healthy control skin with no difference uh, between the groups. And looking at IgG, there was only background nonspecific staining. We used tryptase staining uh, to detect mast cells and there were mast cells around the dermal blood vessels in CIU lesions and non-lesional skin uh, in higher numbers in some patients, but not others. And overall, uh, there were, uh, the mast cells were not any higher in the CIU group than in healthy controls. And this didn't seem to make sense as mast cells are you know, supposed to be the main effector cells in CIU. Uh, but tryptase actually has a very short half-life after being released from mast cells. We know from the allergy literature that tryptase drops to very low levels by six hours. And the lesions that we biopsied were 46 hours old or older. And so we probably biopsy the patient uh, too late to detect mast cell tryptase. Uh, comparing all the immune cell types, uh, within the dermal infiltrates in the CIU lesions. Uh, CD4 positive T cells were the most abundant cell type, uh, followed by macrophages, uh, mast cells, CD8 positive T cells, neutrophils, and not so much B cells or eosinophils. The inflammation wasn't limited to the lesions, and we found similar cell types in non-lesional skin uh, and at similar frequencies. And we were surprised to find this, but it actually does make sense clinically. Uh, the CIU lesions tend to expand and coalesce with adjacent lesions. So cell infiltrates in non-lesional skin could represent lesions uh, progression. Uh, CIU lesions also tend to be transient and migratory. Uh, so individual lesions could last anywhere from an hour to longer than 24 hours. And typically, lesions appear and disappear at different times all over different parts of the body. Uh, so cell infiltrates in non-lesional skin could be just left over from old lesions that looked resolved macroscopically. And it's also possible uh, that CRU skin is intrinsically abnormal globally. Uh, next, uh, we looked at gene expression uh, by RNA-seq. The healthy control uh, samples were clustered, uh, but in contrast, the CIU samples were quite scattered. And overall, uh, there was no clear separation between lesions and non-lesions, which is in keeping with our findings on histology. In the comparison between CIU lesions and healthy controls, uh, 18 genes were more highly expressed in the lesions and 35 genes had low expression. In the comparison between CIU non-lesional skin and healthy controls, 256 genes were more highly expressed in CIU and 190 genes had low expression. Uh, 
In the comparison between CIU lesions and non-lesional skin, we actually didn't find any difference. We selected uh, several genes uh, that we thought would give information about inflammatory signals and look for them uh, by PCR. Uh, IL-25 was more highly expressed in non-lesional skin compared to controls. And IL-25 is produced by many different cell types, including keratinocytes, uh, Langerhans cells, mast cells. And IL-25 has been shown to promote TH2 responses in atopic dermatitis, Schoek-Strauss disease. Uh, CCL-17 was also more highly expressed in non-lesional skin than healthy control skin. And CCL17 recruits Th2 cells uh, to the skin. Uh, SOX3 was more highly expressed in CIU lesions and non-lesional skin compared to controls. And I think we all know, uh, we're all familiar with SOX3 and its many uh, actions. And one of the actions is to regulate T helper cell differentiation. So IL4 induces SOX3 expression and SOX3 binds to the IL-12 receptor uh, and inhibits STAT4 activation and TH1 differentiation. Another uh, regulatory gene, uh, ATF3, was more highly expressed in lesions and non-lesional skin compared to controls. Uh, and ATF3 is expressed by cells that are under stress, for example, uh, ischemia. And ATF3 has been reported to suppress T cell production of IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13 in ovalbumin-induced asthma. So these genes hint at Th2 involvement, uh, but when we looked at T cell genes, we didn't find them to be differentially expressed. The T cell genes were actually expressed at very low frequency in the skin. And you can see that CD3 expression is very low here. And this is keratin that's highly expressed uh, for comparison. Uh, the TCR complex um, uh, is down-regulated re very rapidly after activation. And I think this also makes those genes difficult to detect. But we were still interested in T cells because we'd found them in the blood and we'd seen them in the skin on histology. And we wondered if amplification by PCR would help. We looked for TH1. TH2 and TH17 genes by qPCR. Uh, one patient showed high expression of scatter 3 IL-4, and raw C, uh, but overall uh, there were no differences uh, between a CIU group and the healthy control group. But we've only looked at very few samples uh, so far, and I think with much larger sample sizes, uh, you might detect more patients like this one. So to summarise the skin data, uh, there are many immune cell types uh, within the, the infiltrates and CIU lesions, and skin inflammation isn't limited to the lesions. Uh, CD4 positive T cells are the predominant immune cell type in, within the infiltrates, but they're actually not present in the skin uh, at very high frequency. Uh, we didn't find gene expression to strongly reflect T cell involvement, but we did find that some inflammatory genes were differentially expressed in CIU skin, uh, including IL-25, CCL-17, and SOX3. And follow-up studies of these genes might provide further clues to pathogenesis. So to conclude, uh, we found further evidence that CIU is an autoimmune disease by identifying T cell autoreactivity to FC epsilon R1 alpha. Uh, I think the addition of T-cell assays uh, improves diagnostic sensitivity. Uh, in the skin, the T-cells are the predominant immune cell type within the infiltrates, and inflammation in CIU skin is certainly widespread. And finally, identifying the FC epsilon R1 alpha uh, peptide epitope has therapeutic relevance uh, as a basis for peptide immunotherapy. And finally, I'd like to thank my supervisors, uh, Len, Phil, and Deanna, uh, my PhD advisory committee, Andrew and David, uh, members of the Harrison Lab, past and present, uh, Molecular Medicine Division, 
uh, Matt and Cynthia for analysing the RNA-seq data. Uh, the Royal Melbourne Hospital Immunology and Dermatology Departments where participants were recruited. Uh, the BCRU, VBDR, uh, providers of materials and funding. And last but not least, the participants. Thanks for listening. Yourself. Yeah. So that, um, the proliferative response you saw in those CD4s, those early examples you showed, were really impressive. I was wondering if you were able to phenotype and further look for cytokines, for instance, that might be produced by those cells after activation. Uh, yeah, so we tried to look for uh, TH1 and TH2 cytokines by ELISPA, uh, and the dominant response seemed to be interferon gamma. But what we haven't shown so far is sort of, uh, you know, intracellular staining to show that it is the proliferating cells that are producing those cytokines. We had some patients um, that were on antihistamines and some that were on um, immunosuppressants such as azithioprine. Did you go back and look at the patient history to see if the patients on immunosuppressants were doing better? than patients with other care now that you know it's an autoimmune disease? Uh, so clinically, I think, um, yes, patients were doing better on the immunosuppressants. Um, you know, I think uh, in most cases, the immunosuppressants work quite well. Did you see any proliferation in CD8 cells? Um, in a few patients. So in the strongest CD4 responders, uh, they also had CD8 proliferation. But as a group, uh, they weren't different. One thing that um, I haven't been able to teach um, Priscilla is the TH word. I think it's a real obstacle in immunology. But um, you know, we're trying to fit everything into TH1, TH2, TH17. Um, but that's for another day. But, um, it, it's not a criticism, it's just uh, how difficult it is when you start off with the idea that something should be this or should be that. It's in the textbook, but you, know, it's, you have to wait for people to say, this is how it wants to change. Yeah. Um, could you use uh, your response data for autoantibodies or T cells to? Um, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, we looked at all the different responders and tried to find associations, you know, between disease, you know, severity responses and various different responses. Uh, we didn't find any association, but we only have very few responders in this small group. Um, but potentially, you know, you'd think that people with the T cell responses would, you know, respond to this T cell suppressive therapy. Uh, after a, uh, an episode has occurred and um, uh, it resolves, what's the usual cause of resolution in the, in the patients who have it chronically? Um, that's a very good question and I, d I don't know. It, it just spontaneously resolves. Uh, I think, you know, sometimes even, I mean, the patients would be on therapy, uh, which controls the disease, uh, but often once it's controlled, say, for 12 months and you take the patients off and sometimes it comes back and sometimes it remains in remission. And I haven't, I don't know why. Do their so, cells respond differently? Um, I, I haven't found any uh, <coughs> clinical associations. Uh, but I think I've, I don't have enough patience. Yeah. Was there anything in any of your gene expression data or otherwise that would implicate a temperature sensitive ion channel or something to explain the temperature dependence of the... Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I, I didn't come across it. Yeah. I don't know if anyone picked it up, but Priscilla did mention it, that the, um, there were more differentially expressed genes in the in the unaffected skin than there was in the lesional skin. Uh, or put another way, there seemed to be some decrease of gene expression in the lesional skin compared to the non-lesional skin. And we that's a very interesting finding, apart from the fact that the whole skin globally is abnormal. 
as if, you know, where there's active lesions going on, there's some suppression of transcription. <coughs> There was uh, one more question. Yes. I was just wondering if you've uh, looked into the pep or the protein sequence and thought about potential of epitope mapping and uh, how many sort of peptides you'd have to screen to find it. Yeah, yeah. Um, we we did discuss that. I think early on in the PhD. Um, I think it's two hundred and fifty five amino acids, and we calculated um, the peptides, but I. We're going to have to try and follow your example on celiac <laughs> yes. and put together a cocktail of peptides that we can use for the therapy. Yeah. But there are no more questions. Hang on. <coughs> <laughs>